So let's look at uh, anthrax. Anthrax is another um, basically zoonotic disease. So we're going to uh, characterize the organism, look at the epidemiology, and then the transmission, and then the disease that um, is in um, animals and also in um, humans, and then prevention and control. So the organism, we can characterize it um, quite simply. It's caused by the uh, bacilli called Bacillus anthracis. So it's a gram-positive bacteria, which is non-motile, but normally it occurs in two forms, a spore form and a vegetative form. Okay, so this is this is the spore form and this is the vegetative form. We have over 1,200 strains and basically uh, Bacillus anthracis is well distributed all over the world. So we have talked about the spore and the spore is formed through a process of sporulation basically and it is basically we get the vegetative form turn, turning into the spore form so that the the organism can actually survive or the bacteria can survive in very harsh conditions uh, where we have poor nutrients but we only have formation of spores in the presence of oxygen so like for example when you have a carcass and it is cut open then that now can give rise to spores however when it is still inside the body of the carcass then it's 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 uh not um we cannot have spore relation so spores are very resistant and they can survive even for decades okay but now uh for example for somebody to get infected they must get a certain dosage of the spores so you have to get a substantial amount it is estimated to be like if you get something close to 50000 uh, spores then you can develop the disease so transmission is quite um a straightforward we can have direct spread of the disease um from humans to humans however that is very rare because commonly we get the disease from animals so infected animals normally discharge a large amount of the bacilli from their mouth or nose or rectum so as they discharge that normally the bacilli now ends up going to the soil as spores so spore relation occurs so the spores are the ones that settle now on the grass on the soil and they can stay there for quite some time so the contaminated soil is very important that is point, important reservoir for for this uh, bacteria so infection will actually occur in suspected uh, animals by the ingestion of the spores in the soil so if you have other animals that now come and graze around this area and they take they take up the the bacteria then they also get uh, infected now how how uh, are humans affected so humans can get affected one by actually getting uh, direct contact uh, with with the tissues from um, these animals that have uh, had this condition okay or they get a, a fly <clears throat> so a fly that was on the carcass or that uh, was in touch with the carcass that actually died from uh, the bacteria then they come and bite you then you can also get some cutaneous form of not cutaneous form as in you get the bacteria introduced cutaneously so that's called cutaneous transmission you can also get inhalational uh, especially for those people working um, in turning of hides um, and processing of wool because in essence they're actually handling tissues of animals so if those animals actually had interaction with the bacteria they can actually pass it to the human then we can get it by eating the animal that actually had the bacteria so we get it we get this as a gastrointestinal transmission so animal transmission i've already talked about it so when the and through ingestion like uh, herbivores they as they are grazing so they are eating around where there's contaminated soil and then they get uh the the bacteria because the spores basically if it, they are carnivores and they eat like for example now you assume dogs they eat uh, carcasses of animals that or of cows that died of it then that will be by ingestion they can also inhale or they can get it by a, a bite from an insect which is basically mechanical so the point here is that um most most of the time this bacteria is discharged through the mouth or nose or the anus and then it forms the spores okay and the spores now have become viable for several uh years in terms of distribution we already say that it is distributed all over the world however there are some places that it is almost endemic uh as, as you can see in some places 
uh, where we have this kind of color here, uh, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. But you have some some cases that come up uh, sporadically, and we have so much. Okay, but uh, mostly parts of America and Europe, they have few cases. Okay, but India and Africa, uh, India, Asia, and Africa actually have the highest burden. So the disease in human, how does uh, it look like? Now we've said you can get it cutaneously. So once you get that form um, through the transmission of uh, cutaneous transmission, we call that cutaneous anthrax. So uh, and it constitutes ninety five percent of all cases globally. Incubation period is basically two to three days, and then you start having some um, uh, mal uh, like um, you will start having um, manifestation on the skin. Okay, so you have like a papule, then it develops, you have a, vesic a vesicle, then an ulcer, then an esca. Uh, basically, you have a, a blackish kind of lesion. Okay, so the case fatality here is not that huge. And um, uh, basically, uh, it occurs when we have the spores entering the skin if you have an open wound. So gastrointestinal, uh, one, this incubation, incubation period is around two to five days. And um, it is basically uh, uh, gotten by consumption of undercooked meat or meat that is contaminated and basically causes severe gastroenteritis. Okay. And the case for fatality, as you, as you see, it's around 25 to 75%. Uh, now, the, the most severe one, inhalational anthrax, this has an incubation between one to seven. Uh, normally, the first phase is non specific, so people have fever, fever malaise. But as it progresses, becomes bad, and people end up having severe respiratory distress, uh, ending up with death. So case fatality is normally almost 100%. So 75 to 90% uh, is normally uh, the case fatality, uh, if, if untreated. So diagnosis is quite simple. We just want to find the bacteria. Therefore, if they take a blood sample or a skin sample, uh, then they look at it. Uh, it's able, they're able to identify. So culturing a PCR or some serological test like ELISA, okay? Uh, so treatment, because these are bacteria, is easy. By the way, penicillin is actually uh, can treat most of the uh, strains. However, we have some, uh, nowadays we have some strains that are um, resistant. So ciprofloxacin is normally the drug of choice. And currently there are no, there are no known res resistant uh, strains to ciprofloxacin. Uh, doxycycline can also be used, and normally it's a post treatment of 60 days. Okay, so clinical features uh, are based on they are normally based on which type of um, anthrax you're having. So, if you're having inhalational, as we said, fever, dry cough, so mostly you'll have respiratory uh, manifestation, which will end up having dyspnea until you have like a respiratory kind of distress. So we said mortality is high, close to almost 90 to 100 percent if it is untreated. A cutaneous one, we said it is normally the manifestation will be on the skin and uh, but on top of that you'll have still uh, fever, malaise, headache, but nearby lymph nodes will also be um, will also be uh, inflamed and enlarged. Gastrointestinal anthrax normally will have gastrointestinal manifestation. So like nausea, anorexia, vomiting, fever, and um, also abdominal pain together with bloody emesis or diarrhea. Okay. So prevention and control is um, basically you have to prevent it and control it in animals and uh, humans to be successful. So basically in humans, uh, uh, basically we'll have to... Uh, prevent the interaction with animals that have been affected. So quarantining these animals and in some cases causing um, trade restrictions so that we don't have, for example, cows being transferred to another place. Uh, improved industrial standards. Um, so uh, making sure that actually animals are well um, observed and treated if such cases occur. Uh, safety practices in labs. Uh, post-exposure antibiotics, uh, prophylaxis can also work, and also vaccination of populations at risk, like the veterinary officers, livestock handlers, and so on. Now, opening up or doing an autopsy on dead animals, like ne ne necropsy, where we are actually, um, we actually think we have these cases of anthrax. It is highly, highly um, 
um not 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 encouraged eh? so it is highly discouraged so you do not open the carcass or necropsy is not advised so this is a, a notifiable notifiable disease so it should be reported um to to the relevant public health authorities uh, moreover local regulation determining carcass disposal should be uh, emphasized the animal should actually be incinerated you remember we said like the spores can survive in the environment um, actually for decades so actually they dig up and then they bury and they, they incinerate or they, they they burn them and then they deep bury then the soil around is decontaminated uh, some people use lime to to decontaminate that area okay uh, and now once that is done at least we think that um, that has been sorted out so we don't expect now the spores to come back uh, later on